What's up guys? It's been a while since I've done a reading vlog, so let's do a reading vlog. Um, super like low-key, low-energy day today. I got my second vaccine yesterday and I'm actually not, I don't have a headache or body aches or anything like that. I just feel like my body feels noodly. Like I'm not tired. I just feel like if I had to like lift something heavy right now, I couldn't do it. So I actually, you know, health and fitness tip here from the expert. Look at your plans ahead of time. If you have, you know, workout goals, healthy food goals, whatever, look at your week ahead and figure out what's going to trip you up if there's something that's kind of out of the ordinary, out of your routine, so you can prepare for that in advance. So. Um, instead of my Monday workout, I knew that I probably wasn't going to be feeling up to it today, so I actually did that yesterday. Sunday is my normal rest day, um, so I did a workout for this week yesterday. So anyway, um, I also just happens, it just like fortuitously, two of my clients who I normally have on Tuesday or on Mondays um, are both out of town today. So um, yeah, I don't have to see them. I don't have to like lift heavy things to hand to them, um, carry kettlebells and dumbbells and stuff like that um, demonstrate exercises so that actually worked out really well any client interaction today is just going to be via email or phone call so that's super awesome also I just have a ton more time today because I don't have those um, those clients today but anyhow what am I reading Aaron what are you reading I'm reading tree grows in Brooklyn took me a second there um, by Betty Smith, really enjoying that. It's, um, we follow Francie, who is, she starts off um, as a young girl. I think she's like, f like five or something, kind of when we f are first kind of in her life, um, other than hearing about like, her birth and stuff. Um, in Brooklyn, in the, um, 1910s? Yeah. I think like the 1910s or like teens, because I think the First World War starts. So where I am in the book, um, I'm like, I think I'm like almost halfway through. She just turned 15. And so um, they live in a, they're a poor family. They live in a poor neighborhood in Brooklyn. And um, it's, just, it's kind of about what it is being poor, living in Brooklyn at that time. And, um, you know, getting an idea of what her dad does, her dad, is a drunk and um, we already know that he's gonna die young um, her mom loves her brother far more than she loves him or loves her um, but we see so it's it is a really interesting perspective of like the adults in her life um, her mom her dad um, teachers uh, that kind of thing um, and uh, it's just kind of like a slice of life um, of a young girl in pre-war and now I guess the war is on uh, the first world war in a, a poor neighborhood in Brooklyn um, and then I'm also reading uh, At Home in Mitford by Jan Karen um, not exactly reading along with Kate Howe in her a year in Mitford because they're on like I don't know book three or four is doing like that right now and I'm only on the first book but I just happened um, like a month ago or something to come across uh, a box set of the first three or four of the Mitford books and it's just kind of like a clerical slice of life um, it takes place it's weird because it takes place in the 90s but I think because it's such a small town it feels like it's much like um, earlier in time than it is um, but it's about Father Tim an Episcopal priest and um, his life and the people in his life um, and it's just kind of you know sweet and humorous and um, really nice to dip in and out of. Uh, I'm also reading a coaching book, which I can never remember the name of that book, actually. Um, actually, I'm not going to turn down there. I'm going to park on the street. You didn't need to know that. Um, anyway, so those are the things that I'm reading right now. And hopefully I'll have some time to actually do that. I get so annoyed at myself when I mean to be like devoting some time to reading and then I end up scrolling on my phone. It drives me crazy. I know how to spend time intentionally and I get irritated with myself when I don't actually do that. Oh, 
I'm also listening to, how could I forget, Louise Penny, Kingdom of the Blind. I think it's number 14 in the Armand Gamache series. It is so good. I listened to 13 right before Glass Houses. And then, because I accidentally got 14 on Libby, um, thinking I was on 14, but I was only on 13. So within the first few minutes, I realized that I skipped a book, but 13 happened to be available. So I'm getting to listen to them back to back. These books are so good. I love Armand Gamache so much. I love all of our Three Pines characters so much. If you don't know, the Armand Gamache series is a, like a literary, I need to actually get out of my car and head to where, head to in. Oh, there's a bus in front of me, so hopefully you can still hear me. So Armand Gamache is a uh, basically police detective in Quebec. And he lives now at this point in the series, he lives in this small town of Three Pines. And murders just happen to happen there quite often. And, um, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on 14 in the series, but it's kind of, it kind of, um, like straddles the line between cozy and literary fiction. And she, like Louise Penny just covers so many different aspects of like humanity and life and, um, I heard her in the, the, at the, there was an interview at the end of Glass Houses, book number 13, between her and, I can never, never remember the name of the new narrator, because the original narrator, Ralph Kasham, died, um, <clears throat> but he was asking her if she's ever, like, thought of <clears throat> writing something different, like, writing, writing literary fiction, because she certainly has the chops. Um, but she basically said, like, I don't see the need to because anything I would want to cover in literary fiction, I can do that through Armand Gamache, the, Ar the, the, the Gamache series. So, anyway, I'm about to head inside, so I'm going to stop vlogging. I'm looking like a weirdo. I think it's a whole week later. Not exactly sure the last time I, I updated, but I wanted to talk about what I'm reading. So I'm reading a new nonfiction. This is Anatomy of a Survivor. Building Resilience, Grit, and Growth After Trauma by Dr. Joyce Michael Flynn, and she was actually a professor of mine at Sac State. So my last, my degrees are in speech language pathology, and my last GE class for my undergrad just happened to be within the nursing department, and she is a uh, nurse practitioner. She has a doctorate in, in nursing, and she had a cardiac event um, in her 30s. Um, Basically, she was dead for 20 minutes. She was at a, a swim event. She had a cardiac, a cardiac event in the pool, and her like lifeless body had to be pulled from the pu pulled from the water. And she was re resuscitated for 20 minutes, and ended up with an anoxic brain injury from lack of oxygen to her brain. Incredible recovery. She was a nurse practitioner at the time, so she had a bachelor's degree. Two years after her um, trauma. She went back to school to get her master's and then eventually her PhD. And what she has been studying is post-traumatic growth and a kind of phenomenon in now process, which she calls metahabilitation. Um, so it was really great being her student. Um, her first book came out right after this semester um, when I had her. And um, actually got, she gave me a manuscript copy of it because of my experience with traumatic brain injury. Um, also, she was a runner and a triathlete. And I was a runner and a triathlete or, or am a runner. Um, and so we had like, a, we connected on a lot of different levels. We even ran like the Sac State 5K together and had a really great um, conversation during that race. Um, and so we've kind of kept in touch here and there, like really like through Instagram or LinkedIn kind of things uh, here and there. She has a podcast now. And um, I, this is the first time I'm announcing it like publicly, um, although it won't actually be public until I edit and post this vlog. But anyway, I'm going to be holding a, an in-person health and fitness retreat in July. And she has just agreed to be my keynote speaker. So I'm super, super excited. I wanted to have somebody that is um, more on the mindset side of things. And she and I just like our philosophies align so much as far as, um, actually this Jack London quote, like sums it up perfectly. Let me read the Jack London quote. Since this is a reading vlog and this is literary. So 
Life is not always a matter of holding good cards, but sometimes playing a poor hand well. And that's totally what I talk about all the time, um, not in those exact words, but that's how I was able to achieve and then maintain my health and fitness through being uh, a caregiver. Um, that's how she was able to come back from being dead for 20 minutes to earning her PhD and now really helping others. Um, and we're all going to have crappy cards dealt, situations out of our control. Um, but it's, on, it's, it's the focus on controlling the controllables, fo- focusing on what you can control, the, th- um, the things that you can do. And so I'm, I'm just kind of, I've read the story por- portion of what happened to her. And now in part two, we're getting into more of the academic side of things. Um, and she, from, from what I understand, like the first book was kind of identifying that this phenomenon happens where some people, as a direct result of their trauma, come out the other side of it better than they were before. And actually one of the people in his in her first book that she interviewed, because it's like her story, and then I think she interviews five other people who'd had kind of similar experiences. And this guy said, better, not bitter. Um, and I think that kind of sums, like, to me, that's what really stuck with me from that first book. Um, and so now I believe in the last, like, 10 years or whatever, she has developed a process for, okay, that happens to some people, but can we develop a process like a therapeutic process where we can bring more people to that better not bitter state so i believe that that's what we're getting into in the rest of the book so highly recommend if you have anybody if you've experienced trauma if you have somebody in your life who's experienced trauma or you work with people who experience trauma and then even just as a um, health and nutrition coach i think this will be invaluable in working with um, my clientele who maybe not have had significant traumas like a brain injury or becoming paralyzed but just there's so much so many of the circumstances in our life that are out of control we allow to hold us back um and like i'm always talking about live to thrive the name of my products of my of my programs is live to thrive and she literally uses the word thrive in the first paragraph and i was like yes she is my people so anyway i'm reading that i'm going to finish the chapter i'm on right now and then oh where is it and then I'm going to get back into A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Probably not that much further than I was last week when I talked to you. Um, although, yeah, I am. Oh, I might have been. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a good ways past where I was before. I am hoping to get devote like a good hour to this um, after I finish that chapter before I go do my workout for the day. And then I need to write. Hopefully I'll catch up with you later and not a week later. So I am on my way back from the gym. I walked to the gym. Now I'm walking back home. I went opposite, like opposite directions. I'm kind of seeing, I'm gonna pause my Garmin. Trying to see which one, which way is uh, is faster um, mileage wise. So it was like one and three quarters or so, or two thirds miles uh, the first way I came, which was like via the main road. Uh, And this is kind of the back way, but I wanted to stop. There's this abandoned firehouse right here that I would love to one day buy. There was a while it was actually up for sale. I know somebody who works for the Sac Metro Fire Department, like headquarters, um, administrative wise. Um, but anyway, I would love to buy this at one point and then have it as my like office and fitness center. And because it had, um, it has like the two big garage doors because it was, you know, a firehouse. So there's the two big garage doors there. It would make such a cool gym. Um, and then just like office um, place that I could see clients, nutrition clients, health clients, training clients, um, whatever. Um, anyway, though, I'm listening to Jane Eyre across the street. Oh, the other thing is we're like a mile or probably less from my house at this point. My house is like down this down this hill a bit and then up the next hill into uh, into the neighborhood um i also the other thing that would make it super cool as far as an office goes is the main american river trail is like a half mile or so that way as well so it would just be super cool anyway i'm listening to jane Eyre. it's my uh my book club book this is the third time i'm reading it the first time i read it I think it was the first year I was listening to booktube so like or watching booktube so like 
2018, I think. I think I might have... It might have been when Lauren from Lauren of the Books did June Air, but it might have been the year before that. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, and then last year, I think I read it. Well, maybe she did June Air last year, and then I did it. I listened to it. I'm not sure. Um, I'm listening to the Amazon or the Audible original. Uh, Tandy Newton reads it, which is really good. I'm at the kind of infamous. I'm at the infam infamous gypsy scene right now. I had never really appreciated how much racism <laughs> is involved. We have blackface that are mention of, uh, there's mention of, you know, dark colored skin and big lips at certain points. Um, but I love it. Um, the other thing is I love at the beginning, the first time I ever read it, um, I was like, oh, this is like, I think Harry Potter's origin story is very much um, influenced by Jane Eyre. And there's even one point where her aunt locks her in a closet. So um, I'm going to continue listening to that. And I've got maybe three quarters of a mile left till I get home. Let's see if our tortoise friends are out. Guys, home. Oh, there's one. Hey, buddy. They're so cool. It's like a dinosaur. I think that's the bigger one. I'm all out of breath, by the way, because I just did a couple hill sprints. Whew. I haven't been running um, at all, actually, because I'm focusing on. Uh, body recomp, basically, speeding up my metabolism and um, weightlifting. And so, basically, doing cardio, especially steady state cardio, is kind of the opposite of that goal. Let's see if the other one is out here. So, yeah, that was the first time I've run like in months, let alone sprint. Not over here. You can see though, they've been mowing it down. Neighbors will drop off like lettuce and stuff like that too. Vegetable clippings. Oh, that was a hummingbird that was just there. I love this fencing they have right here. They have a corner lot, if you couldn't tell. There's a water bowl. Where are you? They're usually on the same section of the yard. So the other one might be in their den. So I'm walking to get tacos because Every day is Taco Tuesday in my book. And I want to tell you about this book. I'm reading Anatomy of a Survivor. It is so, so good. Um, she starts by telling her story, which I think I told you guys about a bit before. And then now I think I am through chapter four. And then she starts going into kind of the science of metahabilitation. Basically the science of how our... Um, how our brain is influenced by our situation and how much control we actually have over that. So like one of the things, or the last chapter I just read was on happiness. And they've actually studied like genetically, uh, we kind of have like, they call it a set point for happiness, but that's only about 50% of kind of what determines uh, your baseline level of happiness. And then 10% is based on kind of like your circumstances so your health, your socioeconomic status, that kind of thing. 40% is basically up to you. That's up to your attitude, um, attitude, gratitude, optimism, the way you look at life. And that's absolutely something you can take control of. So that's super uh, uh, encouraging. So, oh, here's Ruby's books. One of my favorite places in the world. Ruby's a dog. All right. I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna go get tacos. Okay, there's a lot going on right now. Different day, it's Tuesday around 11 a.m. 
Uh, I've been working uh, kind of all morning and now I'm out for a walk with my dog. We're out on the trail. Right now we're on like a single path trail, but there's a paved trail over there. Um, it's about a half mile stretch then uh, that kind of goes like from my neighborhood and then it meets up with the main American River Parkway, which is a 32 mile paved trail that goes along the American River. So really great multi-purpose trail goes along. Um, uh, at first it's Lake Natoma, which is actually one of the, um, it's a dammed off portion of the American River and it's one of the premier um, like rowing places in the country. It's where they have the NCAA uh, crew tournaments. So it's really a really cool spot that like is in my backyard. And then back, we actually like my co-working space um, is like three miles up river, um, up lake, up river. Anyway, so we're out here cruising. We had just turned on to from this like little stretch of trail onto the main trail. And I see it, there's a, like a, a call box, like an emergency call box. And I see a guy on a bike, just kind of holding on to it, hanging out. I don't know what he was waiting, waiting for. With some other cyclists come up from the direction that my dog and I were heading in and the guy's like saw a mountain lion over there like wasn't a very big one but I'm like okay I think we'll turn around this guy this 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 cyclist and then a couple other guys who are with him they end up going back in that same direction like let's go check out the mountain lion um no thank you it's we're talking about a mountain lion not like a little bobcat um anyhow so we actually just took a little bit more of a scenic route through um, more of the uh, foresty kind of area. And now we're actually at a um, at a ranch, at a um, uh, stable. I said ranch because it says welcome to the ranch on the sign right there. But um, it's a, uh, it's a horse stable. So you gotta watch out for horse poop when you're walking around here. But. I'll take you over to see the horses. Porta potty there has come in handy. Doing some long runs before. I didn't want to go all the way back up to my house. I don't know how you're going to be able to see him very well, but there's all sorts of horses over here. Goats. Three baby goats. Cute. <laughs> that little chicken looks like it has a boo boo foot. Oh, it's hopping. Say hi. It's a weird looking dog, huh? It says, howdy, we are pygmy goats. Yes, we are supposed to be this chubby. <laughs> Hi. My late husband and I once took care of his uh, aunt and uncle's goats. The horns of the billy goat could actually like slice a carrot, which I had no idea. But it would come up and nibble the uh, like the seams or the pockets of jeans. Well, you're wearing them, of course. Okay, so lots going on. So whilst this uh, mountain lion situation is uh, is happening in real life, listening to Jane Eyre, and you know we kind of got to the the real turning point. Um, in the book. I think it's one, probably one of the greatest disappointments in a book, not disappointed in the book, but disappointments experienced in a book that I can think of. 
um, of where the plot, the characters are, are heading in one direction um, and then something happens. And um, uh, so that's like, that was happening at the same time as there's a mountain lion. So um, anyway, more of the gist. Okay, first of all, like skip ahead a little bit if you don't want any sort of spoilers for Jane Eyre. But the descriptions of Bertha, what the hell? Like purple, swollen faced, like all the, okay, so there's that, okay? But the other thing, and so this is the third time I've listened to this, or second time I've listened, uh, third time I've like read the book. And I'd never thought about this until now. So it was just describing Bertha as this like large, I think virile was used, woman, uh, very strong, big in stature, like basically the size of Mr. Rochester. How is she so big? I mean, like, obviously like you can be like a tall, broad person, but how when she's like locked up in this attic all this time, it's not like she's out like riding horses and baling hay and chopping wood. Like how has she remained this strong living in an attic? And how is Grace Poole supposed to be able to handle her well meanwhile she's you know attacking her brother and she's just attacked mr rochester like that part's not adding up for me that being said this is one of my favorite books um definitely in my top probably three classics um yeah but just some things that i had never really thought of um before so in other news um you know, Monday is Memorial Day, and um, as many of you know, my husband was a Marine. He died last year of COVID, but he had a traumatic brain injury, which he sustained as a Marine. Um, he was hit by a roadside bomb in Iraq, and we lost three corpsmen and, or sorry, one corpsman and three Marines the day that Sam survived. And uh, Sam survived for almost 13 years um, after his severe TBI. So Memorial Day is, you know, a really big deal for me. Um, it's a hard day, a lot of mixed feelings. Um, first of all, never say happy Memorial Day. I know that the intention is there. You think you're being um, grateful, um, patriotic, uh, respectful. But for people who are on the other side of Memorial Day, who it's not an anonymous honoring, you know, it's not an honoring of the anonymous fallen who have a specific person or people who they are honoring. You are saying happy day to remember that this person died for our country. Um, and I know the intention is there, but I can tell you as someone who has been on the receiving end of that, that's not what it feels like. Um, just the word happy, like you would never say happy 9-11. You would never say that. And if you did, you would deserve to be punched in the throat. And that's what it feels like when someone says happy Memorial Day. The other thing is Memorial Day is not for all veterans. It is only for those who have died in service to our country. Um, it's certainly a day, as any a day is, uh, a perfect day to thank anyone for their service. but. Uh, it is a very, very different day than, than Veterans Day. And it makes, when you say it to a veteran, an active duty service member, or one of their family members, it makes them very uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not just speaking on my own behalf. I've had conversations with others uh, about this as well, um, because that's not what the day is about. It's not about them. It's about the guys that didn't come back. And sometimes, you know, they may, they may have seen someone, they may have seen a brother in arms, a sister in arms, die right in front of them. And when you say Happy Memorial Day, or when you say anything kind of about them in Memorial Day, I guess, it it just feels like a dagger to the heart. So, a little PSA um, there. So, that's kind of really where my headspace has been. Um, I spent like eight to nine hours on Saturday on my computer writing a two things writing a speech for memorial day memorial day i'm going to be uh the speaker 
at one of our local cemeteries. It's where um, we had Sam's service. Um, and then also writing a blog. I'll link the blog in the description box. Um, so I basically, if you're familiar with CrossFit at all um, or Hero Wads, you might know about the Memorial Day uh, workout called Murph. There's a particular workout which CrossFit does across the country and people even not into CrossFit will do this on Memorial Day, this workout called Murph. And it's to honor Lieutenant Mike Murphy. He was a Navy Lieutenant who was killed in action in, um, uh, in Afghanistan. And it is a brutal workout. It is meant to be done wearing either body armor uh, because he, he did this workout and he called it body armor um, or a weighted vest. It's a very difficult workout and it's not appropriate for most fitness levels. So I wanted to create a memorial workout that would one, not in need any equipment, it can be done all with um, body weight. Um, and two, um, that would be more achievable and accessible to um, most fitness levels. Um, even people who don't work out, it's meant to challenge you. Um, it is meant to make you want to quit. Um, because that enables you to think about who you're doing it for and to, to dig deep. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I kind of, in the, in the blog, before I get to like what the actual workout is, in the blog, I talk about kind of my experience running. Come on, buddy. I talk about my experience uh, running the Marine Corps Marathon in October of 2019 and how amazing it was and unlike any other marathon and how I was able to kind of tap into honoring the fallen, um, honoring my husband, um, honoring those who have served and have had to basically face situations where if you quit, you die. Um, and yet, you know, I paid to run this marathon. I volunteered to train for this and do this. Um, so, and I think it's really important to be able to, from, from time to time, in a way that's safe, but still super challenging to push yourself and see what you're made of. Um, I think it's a good mental exercise and good physically. And so doing a workout to honor the fallen um, is a really great and motivating way to do that. Stevie will not walk across these metal panels on the ground if I try to make him. He won't. Okay, go. He always walks around them. When I first got him, I thought he was just like, misbehaving all of a sudden walking trying to walk out into the street but then I realized he didn't want to walk on this. He's fine actually with these little yellow bumpy things which is weird. No problem with this. So it must have to do with like can you feel like the electrical hum or buzz? I don't know. The other thing is I'm worried about our tortoise friends because so far this year I've only seen one. I showed you the one the other day and then I saw I saw one earlier. Where is it? He's hiding now. He's under here. Oh, oh my gosh, there he is. Can you see it? Hey buddy. I've only seen one so far this year. So I hope the other one is okay. That's kind of a cool view. Hey buddy. I think it's the other one that was more like friendly and would come up too. So I hope that one's okay. And hopefully it's just in its den. And I just keep missing him. Okay, okay whiny, let's go. I finished a tree girl in Brooklyn. It's like um, 6.05 on Thursday morning. I love this book. I just, I, I was reading this yesterday. Um, I had like 50 pages or so left to finish. Um, and I literally just had like the last 15 pages here to read this morning. Um, I stayed up late uh, reading it last night um, and then couldn't, couldn't hang. Um, but I like I didn't want to finish it. Uh, I was reading so, like some books when you know like it's a really plotty kind of ending. Um, 
you end up like rushing through and reading way faster than you normally did uh, uh, than you normally do. And then sometimes, like with the tree grows in Brooklyn, I end up reading slower than normal because I'm like savoring it, um, and I I keep finding ways to distract myself to not finish it basically. And that's that's how I felt with a tree grows in Brooklyn. Um, I just, you know, fell in love with Francie Nolan and really the whole cast of characters, um, her brother, Neely, and, um, I was thinking about it this morning and the, um, you know, she lives in Brooklyn and it, it, obviously a tree grows in Brooklyn, but it feels like it's, it feels like a small town kind of, um, kind of story where we have they kind of, like the same locations, the same kind of like neighborhood characters uh, pop up at different times throughout the story. And then um, as Francie grows up, she kind of leaves the neighborhood a little bit um, as she's kind of she's very much forced to grow up, you know, faster than she should um, due to you know her family circumstances and then also just kind of like the world circumstances at the time. Um, Oh, I just I just love it so much and I know that I will be rereading this um theme times um in the future. Uh have you read anything else by Betty Smith or if you know of another book, you know, if you've read a tree grows in Brooklyn, you've read another book that reminds you of that, let me know what that is in the comments because I'm here for that. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this vlog right here so I can get it edited. Like I don't even know how long I've been <laughs> filming footage for this uh for this vlog um i think weeks maybe uh, i think my book club for jane eyre is tomorrow night um so i'll be finishing up the audio book of that in the next couple of days with no problem thank you for watching see you around the tubes